Well, we might as well get started. The grief, death, uh, the struggle with our own mortality, the search for a life of meaning, love, the capacity tr for transformation, those forces are ones that make us stop and become introspective and think and, and look within ourselves to see who we are and where we're going. And that's what any totalitarian state seeks to crush. And yet, we kind of blissfully have checked out. Most people have no concept of how fragile their environment is. I think you have to have, as I have done, live in societies that collapse to realize how quickly they go down and how fragile they are. And so there's a kind of emotional incapacity to understand collapse, even when it's facing you. I spent 20 years outside the United States, and I had covered as a foreign correspondent totalitarian cultures, everything from the East German Stasi state to Slobodan Milosevic's Serbia. So I know how totalitarian systems work. I know the kind of dark emotions they evoke. I know the mechanisms they use to shut down dissent. And when I came back, it was utterly apparent that the country had gone collectively insane in a very frightening way. Not only their misunderstanding of the wider world, something as a foreign correspondent I was very cognizant of, but their misunderstanding of who they were and where they were going. The nature of illusion is that it's designed, at least at the moment, to make you feel good about yourself, about your country, about where you're going. In that sense, it functions like a drug. Those who question that illusion are challenged, not so much for the veracity of what they say, but for puncturing those feelings. Attempt to get up and question where we're going and who we are, and the critique will be that you're such a pessimist, that you're such a cynic, that you're not an optimist. Optimism becomes a kind of disease. It's what created the financial meltdown, where you have this kind of cheerful optimism in the face of utter catastrophe, and you plow forward based on an optimism that is no longer rooted in reality. If hope becomes something that you express through illusion, then it's not hope, it's fantasy. The cult of the self is, in biblical terms, a form of idolatry. Everything is about you. Whether it's the worship of power or money, it all goes back to the self. It all goes back to creating little monuments to yourself. All investment into a particular goal of self-aggrandizement is a kind of pathetic attempt at self-exaltation in a kind of maybe even subconscious way at immortality. We have replicated the patterns that past civilizations in collapse underwent an elite that is no longer connected with the real, that retreats into their bubbles, like the Forbidden City or Versailles, and yet has total economic and political power, the crumbling of infrastructure, civilizations always decay, their cities go first, we've already done that, the retreat into illusion. Uh, the danger is that this time when we go down, the whole planet's gonna go with us. The corporate state has made a war against critical thinking, and in particular the humanities, because the humanities at their best are about teaching people uh, how to think rather than what to think. Um, they're about teaching people to challenge assumptions and structures. The discipline of the humanities is subversive. It's meant to be subversive. The other thing that the failure to think critically does is it creates a very frightening historical amnesia. So you don't know how you got here. You don't know where you came from. And again, that is something that popular culture, let's call it totalitarian capitalism, seeks to put in place so that people interpret their problems as personal problems rather than political or social problems. When you don't understand what's going on, 
when you imbibe the illusion that you're fed, the belief that reality is never an impediment to what you desire, that you can have everything you want, that blinds you. It keeps you from seeing what's happening around you. Then, because you are intellectually and emotionally unprepared, you scream for moral renewal and a new savior and a demagogue and vengeance. And at that point, you vomit it up these very frightening figures. So the, the lunatic fringe of our political establishment, which is often laughed at by even a majority of the populace, in moments like that suddenly seizes power. You can oftentimes, in moments of breakdown, have a society uh, clamor for their own enslavement. The cost that we're paying is that the forces arrayed against us are going to kill us. Unfettered, unregulated capitalism is a revolutionary force, as Karl Marx understood. It exploits everything. Uh, everything becomes a commodity. Human beings become commodities. The natural world becomes a commodity that it exploits until exhaustion or collapse. And that's why the environmental crisis is intimately twinned with the economic crisis. 40% of the summer Arctic sea ice melts, and uh, that becomes a business opportunity for Shell that's up there dropping half billion dollar drill bits down into the Arctic Sea. It's insane. When societies reach the kind of end stage, the language by, they use to describe their own economic and political and social and cultural reality bears no resemblance to that reality, which is where we are. The language of free market laissez-faire capitalism is what they feed business students and the wider public, but it is an ideology that bears absolutely no resemblance to the reality, and that gets back to the fact that of living in a kind of culture uh, warped by pervasive illusion and self-delusion. Totalitarian societies by their nature are hyper-masculine cultures and seek to banish empathy. They not only ignore the vulnerable and the weak, but they ridicule them and persecute them. They celebrate supposed values of force, strength, violence, and empathy is seen as weakness. I mean, in a free market society, all of those companies like Goldman Sachs would have gone into bankruptcy. Uh, but we don't live in a so-called free market. We live in a kind of bizarre species of uh, corporate socialism. So in the end process of decayed states, you have forces in essence cannibalizing the state itself, which is where we are. I mean, a poor person of color on the streets of Camden, New Jersey are worth nothing to the state. Put them behind bars, they're worth forty or $50,000 a year to prison contractors and food service companies and phone card companies. And that is something that is very real, but often not even understood by the, by the victims themselves. I'm going to stop for just a second and make a comment. <clears throat> when Chris Hedges says that we are cannibalizing the state itself, what he means by that is we are progressively cannibalizing the resources, human as well as material resources, of the state. And like a, a predator uh, destroys its prey, consumes it, and then moves on to another prey. So uh, when the predator finishes with the United States, they'll go either to Western Europe or South America. Totalitarian societies seek to funnel all intellectual and emotional energy into spectacle, into the Super Bowl, into celebrity saga. It's why the Nazi party made sure every single household got a free radio. And now you sit there and watch Basketball Wives. You see Jay-Z's crib and how many cars he has. And it's the great kind of pacifier. I wrote a book called Empire of Illusion, The End of Literacy and the Triumph of Spectacle, which is about the danger of unplugging yourself from a print-based culture. So I actively resist the attempts by popular culture, which of course is largely dominated by for-profit corporations, 
to give me a language by which I speak and an understanding of the world. Underneath the guise of consumerism is unadulterated hedonism. I mean, it's infected everything, including spirituality, which in its real form has nothing to do with us. It has to do with our neighbor. I mean, the whole point of, and again, I speak as a seminarian, of a life of commitment is picking up a cross. It's not a pleasant experience. It's, it's one that gives one uh, a sense of meaning, a sense of purpose. So, you know, I think that, again, it goes back to values which are largely an anathema to the consumer society. Those are, are values that are rooted in self-sacrifice. It's about giving. It's about self-effacement. It's about understanding that a life of fulfillment comes through service, not through the attainment and acquisition of money, wealth, and things. And I think that that wisdom, which sort of crosses all religious traditions is, is real. I mean, creating community, and, and Freud wrote about it, Karl Popper wrote about it, brings with it a kind of anxiety and a kind of responsibility. And, you know, Freud would argue even a level of neurosis because there's always that tension between individual desire and community responsibility. And I think that that tension is real but one that's necessary. And the consumer society plays very well on that, it magnifies that anxiety to push people into behavior which is um, not only destructive to the community, but finally deeply self-destructive. I covered the revolutions in Eastern Europe. I saw how lonely acts of defiance to totalitarian regimes, which at the moment were considered futile, kept alive another narrative, ironic points of light. That's what acts of conscience, acts of rebellion do. It appears often at the moment that it's meaningless, but when you stand up to decayed systems of power, systems of evil, and you speak a truth, even people within those systems hear your voice. And that's why the state is pushing through one draconian law after another, whether it's the wholesale spying and eavesdropping, monitoring, photographing of every American citizen, whether it's the use of the Espionage Act to shut down whistleblowers, whether it's the National Defense Authorization Act, Section 1021, for which I sued the president, federal court in one, which permits the U.S. military to seize U.S. citizens and hold them indefinitely without due process and military facilities. They're all doing this for a reason. They, they know what's coming. And I've covered uprisings all over the world. You know when the tinder is there. You never know what's going to trigger it. You never know when it's going to come. You never know how it's going to express itself, but you know it's there, and it's, it's definitely here. The corporate state knows no limits at this point. It has no regulation, it has no government control, it writes its own laws, it writes its own legislation. So the, the rise of popular culture and the obliteration of real culture is part of this entire corporate totalitarian assault on beauty and truth. And that's what they have to seek to eradicate because those forces are ones that remind us about how we should live. and about what it means to be human. You know, going into Sarajevo, which I did during the war, where 2,000 children have been shot, 45 of my own colleagues have been killed, uh, four to five dead a day, uh, two dozen wounded a day, constant sniper fire, wasn't pleasant, but it was meaningful. And one, I think, has to begin to make that decision, whether they want a life that means something, or whether they want to leap from one hedonistic high to another. You can't talk about hope if you can't see reality, and reality is pretty bleak. But that's the starting point. I am very grateful to Chris Hedges because he has put his finger on several of the issues that a, we are attempting to deal with in this class, and B, um, point out the profound uh, decay in our own society and 
governmental situation. Um, you cannot talk, hope requires that you look at reality, because if you're not looking at reality, you're not dreaming of a realistic possibility. And hope is always about realism. So I want to, I, I appreciate, by the way, the name of that video was called American Psychosis. It is available on YouTube, and I'm going to elaborate on it for the next few minutes with a PowerPoint presentation. If I can get it to boot up, which is doing right now. This is the United States. You have the uh, Israel lobby suckling and drawing off nutrients. You have the military industrial complex. You have the media. You have big pharma. Uh, let's see, you have the uh, extraction industry. And oh, let's see, uh, extraction in your big pharma, media. I think I covered those. And the last and big one is the blood-sucking squid that Matt Taibbi spoke about. Uh, let's see, can I, get, where can I, hmm. Matt Taibbi wrote about the blood-sucking squid by the name of Goldman Sachs. But I'm enlarging it because Goldman Sachs is simply one of the members of the, uh, big banks of the United States and the big banks of Europe and the big banks are what own the United States. They own the United States because in 1933 Franklin Delano Roosevelt signed over your Ketam Trust to the Federal Reserve Bank. All American property all American labor has been used as security for the loans that the Federal Reserve System grants to the United States. Before 1933, certainly before 1900, if you bought property, you owned it outright. You didn't pay property taxes. If you wanted fire protection, you paid for the fire department to service your town, but you owned it outright. If you don't pay your property taxes now, what will happen to it? Catherine? The government takes your house back. Eventually they'll come and take your property. And if they increase your property taxes by 50% each year, what will happen? Eventually you can't pay it. And they will... Own it all. They will own it all. That's exactly right. And legally, because of the signature of Franklin Delano Roosevelt, they can do that. Howard Freeman had a discussion with a, uh, a judge, a middle-level judge, who probably spoke more than he should have, and this middle-level judge told him that the bankers, that is the Federal Reserve System, owned the United States, locks, stock, and barrel. They choose not to foreclose. They choose not to foreclose because there are too many guns still in the hands of free citizens. So they let us go on pretending as if we... They do not foreclose. A, we are much more useful as portions of that sow than we are otherwise. There are too, are, are too many guns in the world and especially in the United States, so why foreclose? All of the income tax that each one of us pays does not go to pay for the projects of next year for the federal government. It all goes to pay the interest on the loan that the government has taken out with the Federal Reserve System. 
there are four officials of the Internal Revenue Service. There are two commissioners of the Federal Reserves of the Internal Revenue Service, and there are two secretaries of the Treasury. Now the two commissioners both happen to live in the United States. One of the secretaries of the Treasury is in fact the Secretary of the United States Treasury. But in the IRS code, there are multiple places where the secretary is referred to, and the secretary who is being referred to is the Secretary of the Treasury of Puerto Rico. Because it is in Puerto Rico that the trust is located where all of the funds from the income taxes are deposited. Now, we know who is putting money into that trust. It is the United States Treasury. <clears throat> By law, we are not allowed to find out who is taking money out of that trust, nor who established that trust. Though I think it's a pretty safe bet that the federal government in 1933 established that trust. I want to talk about these people Howard Freeman, I already told you a significant uh, amount about Howard, and he was one of several people who discovered that there are two entities, governmental entities, I should say, two governmental entities known as the United States. One of those entities is the corporate United States known as the United States, which occupies <coughs> the position of among the nations of the earth. The government of that entity has sovereignty <coughs> only over the District of Columbia and the territories of the United States. It does not have sovereignty within any of the sovereign states of the, uh, any of the sovereign 50 states of the United States. The second entity, governmental entity, that is known as the United States is that government that governs the District of Columbia and those territories. So we have two governments squatted one on top of another, both of which are called the United States. Now as a state citizen, if you were born in Iowa or Illinois, not born in the District of Columbia and not uh, working for the federal government, by law, you are a citizen of the, of the collective United States, but you are not a citizen of the federal United States. And the way you unintentionally volunteered to pay income tax is A, by paying for it the first time or by taking out a social security card or taking advantage of any of the multitude of so-called services the federal government provides. In doing so, you gave up the rights you held implicitly by being a constitutional citizen of the United States, you surrendered those rights for the privileges granted by Congress to the citizens of the federal United States. That has some incredibly important, uh, let's go, there we go, significances. Howard Freeman was one of the first people to discover that we had two governments. The United States Congress is the Congress of both governments, it is also the judiciary of the government of the D District of Columbia, and it is also the chief executive of the District of Columbia government. So when you go to court, in theory, you are going to a court that is managed by the Constitution. That is called an Article Three because the third article of the Constitution deals with the judiciary. However, there are several layers of courts in the United States government. 
The first layer of courts are district courts. The second layer of courts are appellate courts. And the third layer of courts is the Supreme Court. And unfortunately, the very first layer, the district courts, are legislative courts. They are not courts that are governed by the Constitution. They are courts that are governed by the laws passed by Congress. The laws passed by the, the district courts may or may not recognize your constitutional rights. Those are privileges that may or may not be granted. In the appellate courts, they are governed by the Constitution, as is the Supreme Court. But I want you to notice, there's an initial barrier. Before you can ever be judged in the constitutional sense, you have to get past the legislative tribunals. And I'll get into what that means in a few moments. Anyone who's read the IRS regulations becomes confused and wonders what in the world does this, that, or the other thing mean. The interesting thing is that is, that is not the case when we are looking at other portions of the United States Code. One comes to the conclusion after very careful reading that the Code of the Internal Revenue Service is intentionally obtuse. The reason it's, a, the reason it's obscure is they need and want state citizens to volunteer to be federal citizens. And almost nobody who knows the difference would volunteer to be a federal citizen. Unfortunately, it is also the case that in those systems, if you are if you are fighting the government, <coughs> the probability is that you're going to lose before you've even started. I will give you a couple of examples. I don't think there are very many people who would be judged sane who would think that a dollar bill is equivalent to a speech. And yet recently our Supreme Court came to the uh, opinion that money was the equivalent of speech. Now, speech can be spoken, it can be written, it can be implied by the use of one's fingers in Braille. It is common to every human being who has sufficient mental ca capacity to communicate. Is that true of a dollar bill? Well. Half of the world's population lives on less than two and a half dollar bills per day. So either speech has the quality of being massively maldistributed, or the Supreme Court was simply in error in judging that speech was that money was a form of speech. The name Paul Mitchell occurs up there for this reason. I wanted to tell you about Mr. Mitchell. <coughs> Most people would probably not like him because he has a mind like a mathematician, but he uses it like a lawyer. He's not a lawyer, but he is, he's the kind of individual who can read 12 pages of text and know what they say and know where the fault lies in argument in, on page 7. He proved to Chief Justice Rehnquist that the United States Supreme Court did not have a quorum to judge a case arising in the state of California. In order to pass judgment on cases arising in California, you need to have a valid and current California practice, California license to practice law. The Supreme Court had four people who had such licenses, and the remainder either did not have a record of it or did not have the license. Now, to have a quorum, you need six. Now, Mr. Mitchell's reward for proving the Supreme Court uh, was inadequately uh, uh, empowered 
was to be arrested in the middle of the night, transported across several state borders, and incarcerated for about three months and uh, subjected to what is considered uh, forms of torture by isolation. He was released after about three months and I think he was somewhat chagrined. He knew that his legal argument was correct, but he also found out that the U.S. Marshal had the power even if he didn't have the right. Danny Shahin uh, has gi given several talks and I have followed Danny's career and lectures in, from California on a number of occasions and I applaud very strongly what Mr. Shahin has to say about our federal government. I realize now, however, why Mr. Shayan is still lecturing instead of being silenced. And he's lecturing because Mr. Shayan sees the solution to our governmental problems by electing somebody else. Now, a famous definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and over again and expecting a different result. I would submit that in the 1990s, people voted for Bill Clinton because they wanted something, some different policy than George Herbert Walker Bush. They voted for Barack Obama because they wanted some different policies than George W. Bush. And it is a certainty that they voted for Donald Trump because they wanted some other policies than Hillary Clinton. I'm going to point out that in all three of those cases, they didn't get what they voted for. In fact, I would submit that every decade and a half or so, we successfully vote out one collection of bastards and vote in another collection of bastards. The Chinese have a joke that they are unable to oust the Communist Party from China. But they are eminently able to change the policies of the Communist Party in China. <clears throat> Whereas Americans are able to oust the given party every four years. But they are totally incapable of changing the policies. <clears throat> when Bernie Sanders ran against Hillary Clinton in 2016. <coughs> he did not say anything, zero, about American foreign policy. And yet it is American foreign policy that has bankrupted the United States, that has enriched the military-industrial complex. It has made Israel the strongest military force in the Middle East. It has created earthquake, unstable earthquake zones due to fracking in the United States. It is precisely the policies of the United States that have brought us to where we are, those seven pigs feeding off the sow and that one blood-sucking squid are never addressed by Bernie Sanders, and I will dare say that they will not be addressed by Tulsi Gabbard. Or if they are, they, are, they will be addressed in one or two speeches that will be, like, like Barack Obama's speeches, will be promptly forgotten come January. I want to tell you a little bit about common law and civil law. So I'll be interrupting this every once in a while because there are some errors that I want to correct as well as we go. There are three basic structures for legal systems. They are common law, civil law, and religious law. Common law was developed in Northern Europe during the Middle Ages by Germanic and Nordic people. It was brought to England by conquerors. <clears throat> In modern times, England has spread common law around the world, especially to the many places that were settled or colonized by the English. 
Civil law began with the Romans. The Byzantine Emperor Justinian, a Roman himself, assembled a team of experts who condensed and simplified the Roman law into one single body of law. The Byzantine system spread through southern Europe and then northward. Today, nearly all of Europe uses civil law. Religious law would include systems like Sharia law, a law system used among many Muslim nations. This map of the world shows the nations that use civil law in blue, common law nations in red, and religious law nations in green. Almost none of these countries are pure in their law systems, but these colors represent the legal tendency they base their system on. We want to stop there because the United States' picture, although it doesn't come through well in that projection, is the United States and Canada are projected as being uh, common law. That is an error. It is what is constitutionally mandated that the United States judiciary uh, use common law uh, to exercise, to, to adjudicate cases. In point of fact, because the judiciary is now in three levels and Congress has instituted legislative tribunals at the first level, they are in fact employing civil law at the level of the district court and common law at the level of the appellate and supreme court. Moreover, uh, what the young lady doesn't describe is that uh, in Israel there is substantial bending of civil law to religious law. It's not widely recognized, but religious law is very important to the religious Jews of Israel. Um, when people talk about Sharia law, they are unaware that Sharia law and Judaic law are incredibly similar when actually practiced. We're not going to go into religious law in this discussion. What we want to do here is compare and contrast common law and civil law. Common law uses case law as its basis. In other words, the law is established case by case as judges make rulings. Current judges read the decisions of the past and base their decisions on what was decided before. Lawyers read the decisions of the past and base their arguments on those past decisions. If no ruling on an issue has yet been made, then judges decide in the absence of laws, in essence creating law or precedent. Judges also are the ones who determine the meaning of legislation in individual cases. They interpret the law. In countries with common law, a long process of time and thousands and thousands of rulings determine the legal decisions of the present. In other words, centuries of human experience and wisdom are utilized to arrive at correct and just decisions. That does not mean bad decisions are not made. It also does not mean that bad decisions cannot be overturned and new precedents set. But a good judge would think very carefully and hard before changing the direction of thousands of decisions that came before. In fact, the ability to change or hone the law into an ever more just system is the main strength of common law. The fact that judges confirm the law from the past and establish the law for the present and future is the reason common law countries elect local judges by the people. The people ought to be choosing wise and just men and women. In common law, it is crucial to understand that the judges are chosen by the people. The people have the power over the courts just as they have all the other powers of government. They give these powers to those chosen to judge them. And so the common law system stems from the people. Codified law, or civil law, is written by government officials. Courts of law make decisions based on the codified law, not on previous decisions. Judges have no power to change or adjust an unjust law. If a new situation comes up, the judges in a civil law system cannot make a decision until new law is written by the government. So while common law is based on the power of the people, civil law is based on the power of government. Civil law can and is changed frequently as new parties get into power and impose their will on the people they rule over. But in individual cases, the civil law is inflexible. It does not allow for an evolution in the ideas of justice or changes in circumstances or technology. A new set of legal problems has recently arisen in the world due to the internet. These problems deal with copyright issues. It has become easy to transmit and use digital data. At the same time, the monetary value of images, videos, and songs has dramatically declined. The strength of the internet is that data and knowledge are so easily shared. It has made the world a better place. But there are people whose work has been stolen and shared without pay. 
There are also people who claim ownership of things in the public domain. And there are disputes over fair use, the sharing of digital data between friends when no money changes hands, and on and on. How do the courts resolve the problems? In a common law country, individual cases will be brought before courts of law, and many different judges in different jurisdictions will make decisions. These decisions will be based on previous copyright cases, as well as previous cases regarding the public good. Judges will try to base their new decisions on what is the most just for all parties. Over time, a body of case law will be built up. There will be a trend starting to develop which will determine the direction that cases in the future will be decided. If at least most of the people have done their job and elected competent, fair judges, then the new laws will be a consensus of the most just way to deal with internet copyright law. But in a civil law country, a different process will happen. If no law has been written about an issue, like internet copyright issues, then a judge will often make no decision, refusing the case. At some point, the government will create a new law about internet copyright to address the issues. No matter what decisions have been made in previous cases, all future cases will be decided based just on the new law that was written. It may be fair, and it may not be fair. When a new party or faction comes into power, the law may be changed. Previous decisions will not matter, and all future cases will be decided only on the new law. Common law is based on the power of the people and on thousands of prior cases and hundreds of years of human experience. It is constant, but not inflexible. It is able to deal with new legal issues as they come up. Civil law is based on the power of the government of the moment. It is subject to the political winds of the day. It is changeable, but inflexible. It cannot by itself deal with new issues, but must wait for legislation. Questions? Okay, I have one other discussion to lead, to lead with. Uh, I should have Catherine deliver this because she is trained as a lawyer, but I will deal with it. Law is a different kind of language. Uh, there is a difference between an operator and a driver. There is a difference between an automobile and a motor vehicle. When you apply for your driver's license, you are applying for a license to drive a motor vehicle for hire. Whether it be a truck or a car, you are basically applying for a, a license to drive a motor vehicle for hire. Now, you may never ever drive a motor vehicle like a taxi cab or what is Uber. The, or, uh, Uber. Uber. But that's the kind of license you are applying for. Strictly technically, you do not need a license to drive an automobile, no, to operate an automobile. Because you can operate an automobile for pleasure without a license. However, you'll still get a, a, a ticket for it because the police officer doesn't know that. Indeed, I'm going to be describing for you some of the ways of avoiding exactly these problems. Um, if you say you understand the judge, you are saying that you are submitting yourself to his judgment and jurisdiction. So if you want to communicate that you comprehend him, you better use the word comprehend rather than understand, if indeed you choose to, to challenge his jurisdiction over you. A person may be an idiot before a judge and be perfectly and have an IQ of 150, because an idiot is a person who stands on his own recognizance and authority rather than. Uh, under someone. A client in law is one who is intellectually unable to take care of his own affairs and therefore he hires a lawyer to deal for him in the legal affairs. And the best multiple meaning word is colorable. Colorable is an adjective that describes something that looks like it's something, but isn't. For example, if Catherine's book there was actually a secret 
uh, compartment, you know, with one of those compartments in the middle for hiding coins or something, you would call it a book because it's not really a book. <coughs> it's colorable. It looks like a book, but isn't. And there are things that look like general agreements that are really ironclad contracts. And therefore they are colorable agreements. They are, they are something other than what they look like. And I have come away with the impression that on no small number of occasions uh, lawyers develop terms not only because of their antiquity but because of their ability to be twisted like a pretzel. If that's prejudicial to those in, in, in the room, I apologize. The young lady on the previous film described three types of law, that is common law, uh, canon law, and civil law. Uh, there is, uh, are several other ways of categorizing it. What she was talking about as civil law is in the United States called statutory law. Statutory law is made by a representative body such as Congress, and it is the law upon which um, certainly the district courts act upon in federal district courts. We are guaranteed by the Constitution courts managed according to common law, and common law has come to be to embrace not only what is usually known as common law, but also equity law and admiralty law. Admiralty law uh, refers to uh, occasions for suit and crimes on the open sea. Equity law is law, the law of contracts, but interestingly, and this, this is a caveat I have to add, equity law concerns contracts that are clearly and known to be contracts by both parties involved. And common law is as described in the, in the British literature. So in the United States, you basically have something akin to a combination of common equity and admiralty law exercised by the appellate courts and the Supreme Court, and statutory law exercised by the police court, the justice of the peace who would fine you for not having a fishing license, the... Uh, judge who would fine you for not wearing your seatbelt, all of those are statutory courts or legislative tribunals. Some American history. In 1785, the Constitution, uh, no, in 1785, the Treaty of Paris was signed whereby the nation of Great Britain had authority over admiralty law because it referred to the open sea. And the United States had no navy and it was perfectly happy to establish a judicial arrangement with Great Britain to have Great Britain handle any problems that arose in the open sea. Somewhere around 1812, admiralty jurisdiction passed to the President of the United States as Commander-in-Chief. In 1868, the entire uh, judicial system was I will say assaulted, because in 1868, lawyers discovered that they had two governments, and one government was remarkably, remarkably manipulable. The government of the, of the sovereign United States, the government that had extraterritorial sovereignty over the 50, oh, at that point in time, 29, I think, sovereign states, and the government called the government of the United States that had jurisdiction over the District of Columbia and the territories. There weren't any territories. Well, there was the Northwest Territory at that time. In 1871, the lawyers started exploiting that difference, and Congress started passing laws that were laws of the United States that were made applicable to a lot of people who were not subject to that law. That became especially evident 
1912 and in 1933. In 1912, Congress stopped supplying a form of money. It stopped coining gold coins. In 1898, it refused to adopt silver as a form of currency. William Jennings Bryan lost the election partly because of defending silver as a form of, of money. That was just fine as far as the major banks were concerned because in 1912 they successfully got the Federal Reserve System introduced as a way of introducing a substitute for money. If you take out a paper bill, you'll notice that it's called a Federal Reserve Note. That is not money. It is a substitute for money. It is a promissory note. It is as if 500,000 people were given a bunch of blank pieces of paper on which was written IOU Uncle Sam. And they had a number on them and that number indicated how many dollars that IOU was worth. And we have been exchanging that, those paper IOUs since 1933. <coughs> the, the 50 states were seduced into using this substitute for money because the federal government gave them all kinds of grants, including money to sponsor, to, to fund um, a number of Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal projects. And the people who were working for the New Deal were paid in Federal Reserve notes. There were no gold coins, so all of the states started using this substitute money. There's a hidden contract, however, involved in using that substitute money. In choosing to use that substitute money, everyone who chooses to use that substitute money is volunteering to be a federal citizen of the United States. Let me get this up to the top again. And then don't they also make it illegal to have any other kind of currency? They, not to have any other kind of currency. For example, Bitcoin is not illegal. But they do make it illegal to use silver or gold, and especially gold as a form of currency. <coughs> they explicitly deny and will uh, prosecute someone who is using for, uh, gold as a form of money. Really? I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. There are several money changers who will sell gold coins, but they will not s they will sell them for their gold value, not as coins per se. In 1938, this became, there are several, in the, several significant dates here, but in, to summarize, the United States, the, the people who are citizens of states, almost all of them have unwillingly unconsciously, unknowingly, volunteered to be federal citizens. In volunteering to be federal citizens, you volunteered to pay income tax, and you volunteered to, pay, to follow all of the statutory laws of Congress, and in volunteering to follow all of the statutory laws of Congress, you almost certainly also volunteered to follow all of the statutory laws of the state in which you live. By common law, the only law is you don't hurt anyone, you don't hurt anyone else's property, you don't interfere with what someone else is doing, you let him be what he is, and let you be what you are, unless you damage someone else or his or her property. That's common law. Equity law which is also not statutory law, equity is defined by the contract. The contract says, I'm going to do this and you're going to do that, and if you don't do that, you are punishable under equity law for a fine. Not a criminal prosecution, but a financial prosecution. You can be fined. You cannot be jailed for failing to keep a contract, but you can be fined for it. <coughs> Under admiralty law, 
you can be imprisoned for not keeping an international contract. That is almost never observed or put into practice because admiralty law, at least between the East Coast and the West Coast, is unknown. It would, however, be enforced if you happen to be boating on the Mississippi River, which is considered navigable waters. Because in 1845, the federal government assumed jurisdiction of all navigable waters in the United States. So that they, under admiralty law, assume jurisdiction not only of the open seas, but all navigable waters. That was probably their first power grab in 1845. But all of the laws that we follow in the state of Iowa, virtually all of them, are statutory laws. So I want to give you an out. Since you did not volunteer to be a federal citizen, I want to tell you about the first principle of law, <clears throat> and that is jurisdiction. You were roped into volunteering to be a federal citizen without your knowledge. If, however, on all of the checks and all of the official documents that you signed, you write, without prejudice, Universal Commercial Code 1-308. You will retain your common law privileges. What that does, uni uh, Universal Commercial Code 1 is dealing with contracts that you got dra dragged into without your intent. And 308 allows the unwitting victim of that unwitting contract to declare and maintain his or her common law privileges and constitutional privileges. What you are doing here by putting that underneath your signature is you are saying, I insist on maintaining all of my constitutional privileges guaranteed me by the United States Constitution. Have you ever done it? Pardon? Have you ever done it? I have, I have a rubber stamp now, and I will do it on all of my official documents. I purchased a rubber stamp online that says, without prejudice, UCC 1-308. Yes. I'm going to do this incrementally, Catherine. I may get to the point of actually challenging the IRS, but I'm going to do it incrementally because I know I cannot beat the power, but even the power has chinks. And let me give you an example. There are people who have successfully argued their state citizenship and have been excused from paying federal income tax. Since then, <coughs> the tax code is revised about every decade. And every time it is revised, the IRS lawyers succeed in making the, the escape holes smaller and they're still sufficiently intent on appearing law abiding that if you can find the right escape hole you can still now it is perfectly legal to say you are not a federal taxpayer but if they succeed in getting you into tax court tax court is a legislative tribunal you have no recognizable constitutional rights there. If they ask you, are you a citizen of the United States? And if you say no, then they don't have jurisdiction. But 999 persons out of a thousand in tax court, if they are asked that question, will say yes. And once they say yes, they are under the jurisdiction of the tax court. I think that's enough for today. I am open to questions. I hope to tell you something, a few more things about both American law and what I'm learning about this online course. But if you have any questions, I'll entertain them.
What is the online course on law? The online course is uh, given by a, an agency called the Jurisdictionary. It costs about $240, and it basically tells you how to be your own lawyer if you are sued or being, if you are sued or want to sue another individual. Totally useless if you are uh, in the clutches of the federal government. It probably would be useful if you were in the clutches of the state government, but totally useless if you're fighting the feds for a variety of reasons. But it, it is law as the law is being taught to lawyers. Probably 95% of what I have shared with you today is not shared with lawyers. It is known by the judges halfway up the judicial ladder but it's not known by the JP, almost certainly. And I think that kind of knowledge would be useful for people, especially those who want to have some background but can't afford the 250 bucks. And I find it fascinating because it is a football game or a baseball game. And if you go into it without knowing how it is played, it's like trying to play baseball when the other game is playing foot, the other side is playing football. Uh, they're going to score a lot of touchdowns before you have a clue as to what's going on. Thank you for your attention. Thanks.